Your name, sir? Uh, Dr. Kevin Horn. And who do you work for? Uh, Maricopa County Medical Examiner's Office. How long have you worked there? Uh, almost 12 years. And what is it that you do over there at the uh, Medical Examiner's Office? I am a medical examiner. I'm, I'm charged with examining deceased uh, individuals and certifying a cause and manner of death within the county. Uh, we're looking at a frontal x-ray of the head and on the left side, I'm sorry, on the, on the right side of the uh, x-ray you can see a projectile. When you say, you said the left side, that would be the left side of Mr. Alexander, correct? His left, our right as we look at the x-ray. Uh, exhibit number 172, what are we looking at here? We're looking at a side view of the head, again, showing the projectile. And this is where the projectile ended up, correct? Yes. Is it, and it is on the left side, even though this is the right aspect. Yes, it's his, it's his left cheek area change. And are there any injuries on the top of the arm? Uh, there is an injury to the thumb, which I don't think is really clearly visible in this photograph. All right, let's then take a look at exhibit number 176, which shows us what, what are we looking at here? This is the palm of the right hand, and I think there may be another picture that shows this better, but there is a, an incised or a cutting injury of the tip of the right thumb. And Oops. exhibit 177, is that what you're talking about? Yes. In looking at injuries, are you able to tell whether they were made before death, after death, or at the time of death as part of the examination? Sometimes, it depends on the case. How about this one right here? Could you tell by looking at it and, and conducting an analysis whether or not this was done um, either before death, at the time of death, or after death? I think it was done before death. There is hemorrhage associated with it. When you say that there's hemorrhage associated with it, explain that a little bit uh, more to me. Um, does a, what is it that causes a person to hemorrhage if they're alive, which is what I think you're telling me? Well, if you have a heartbeat, you're going to have blood flow to an area that's injured, and so you'll have blood flow from an injury. So if the skin is cut or torn, uh, there will be a great deal of blood that will come from an injury in a living person. A deceased person will ooze some blood, um, but uh, not a great deal. So in this one right here, it is your opinion that uh, Mr. Alexander was alive when this was inflicted? Yes, taking into consideration what I said and also in context with other injuries that are on the hands. Um, and what kind of injury is this one that we're looking at? It's a sharp force injury. It's caused by a blade or a, or a sharp forced object. If an individual, let's, let's get away a little bit from a knife right now and just focus on the individual maybe who is dragged or is hit, that kind of thing. If an individual is dead, and somebody applies some force, hits them. Are they going to bruise necessarily or not? There may be something that would look like a bruise, uh, but it will not be as large or as, uh, and the color will be different in a deceased person uh, mm -hmm. because there's no blood flow to the area. So you're actually just breaking blood vessels in that area and there, whatever blood happens to be there will ooze out, but there won't be blood pumped into the area. And part of the reason I ask that is I see that there's sort of like on top of it a little bit of a darker area. Is that mummification or is that bruising? It may be a combination of both. There's some darkening underneath the, uh, the nail there, um, but in the context of the mummification, I can't really say for sure. Are you familiar with the term defensive wounds? Yes. And de define that for me, please. Uh, they're based largely on lo location on the body. If you have injuries to the, uh, the backs of the forearms or to the palms or backs of the hands, um, you can have gunshot wounds in those locations or in the case of an assault with a knife or an edged weapon, you can have uh, cuts or, or, or um, uh, incised injuries to the backs or the palms or the backs of the forearm and it's consistent with someone trying to either grab the knife or for, uh, um, uh, fend off wounds or fend off injury. And the way you described it, uh, by necessity, the person would have to be conscious and alive, correct? Yes. And is this that we're looking at, the right thumb, is that a defensive wound? Could be, yes, consistent with that. Let's take a look now at uh, what are we looking at there. This is the back of the left hand. Do we see any injuries here or not? Uh, you can see the edge of an injury on the side below the thumb, the side of the hand, and then also on the back of the thumb. So there are two injuries that are partially visible here. And those injuries, if we look at uh, Exhibit 180, do those show those a little bit more? Yes, this is the palm of the left hand, again showing uh, from the side of the thumb 
um, near the wrist, there's a fairly deep wound that's going into the muscle there. There are two separate wounds of the palm uh, below the index finger. And then um, I believe there's another injury on the thumb that we've already described. Uh, in looking at these, just to the naked eye, and obviously naked eye may not tell us everything, um, as we compare those to the injury to the right thumb, these seem to be a little bit deeper. Is that true? Or yes. Not? And how deep are these in comparison to the ones that we saw in the thumb? The one on the thumb is fairly superficial. It just clips off part of the nail. Uh, this is actually going into the soft tissue and the muscle beneath the hand, so it's going in a depth of about a quarter of an inch for all three injuries. And if you, if you look at this, are you able to tell us what type of blade is doing this other than that it's a knife blade? All I can say is that it's a sharp-edged object. Take a look at uh, Exhibit 181. And this has a scale to it, correct? Yes. And so, for those of us that are really not versed in, in metrics, how big would you say this one is, the larger of the two? Uh, that measurement in inches is one and three quarter inch. And this one right here, the one down there? Three quarters of an inch. Taking a look at uh, Exhibit 182, now we're looking at those first two injuries that we described, the one near the wrist and the one on the higher up on the thumb, correct? Yes. Were these also deep, this one that I'm pointing to near the wrist, was that deeper than the one on the right thumb? Yes. And if we look at 183, we have the scale there, correct? Yes. How big was that one? That was measured in inches, one and one half inch, and on the back of the thumb, one inch. One of the things that we talked about with regard to the other injury to the right hand was whether or not they were consistent with defensive wounds. In this one, were these consistent with defend defensive wounds? Yes. And does that mean that Mr. Um, Alexander was alive at the time that these injuries were inflicted? I believe he was. Would they have bled at the time? Yes. Take a look at uh, Exhibit 185. On the shoulder there, do you see that? Yes. Uh, is that an injury there? Yes. Uh, how big is that injury in terms of inches? I know we have the metric scale there, but how big is that? It's on the right shoulder. Just looking at the, the photograph, you do have a, an English and a metric scale on the same side, so it's about, an, uh, each of them, the largest of them is about an inch. Is, is this a deep sort of cut, or is this sort of a grazing kind of cut? Very superficial grazing injury. But it would bleed, correct? Yes. And how about this one right here that we're looking at right there? This is that is uh, characterized as a stab wound, so it's actually a, a deeper wound, um, but it actually uh, um, terminates at the breastbone, doesn't go into the chest cavity. So as it was going in, it actually hit the breastbone and did not go any further, correct? Right, yes. Would this wound have been fatal, whether uh, immediately or rapidly or alternatively longer term? Not in and of itself, no. But it would bleed, correct? Yes. We then go to the one right here. Um, first of all, how big is that one? Just, uh, just in looking at the scale, uh, it's about two and a half inches in length. It's uh, uh, transverse across the, the chest or extending horizontally across the chest. And it's also, uh, it's a deeply incised wound so the blade is going below the skin, but it's, it's not entering the chest cavity either. You use the term incised that Yes. I don't think he used before. What it, how do you define incised? Oh, well, sharp force injuries are usually di divided into stab wounds and incised wounds. So a stab wound is deeper than it is long on the surface of the skin, and the incised wound is just the opposite. It's so if you longer take a, than it is deep? Yes. If you take a razor and cut yourself on the skin, that's an incised wound. But if you stab yourself with a knife, then that's, that's a deeper wound. And this one right here, which is sort of below the chin and down here to the sort of the median. Can you tell me a little bit about that in terms of whether or not this is uh, 
stab wound, whether or not this is an incised wound. Can you tell me about that? It's a stab wound, and I do think we do have better views of it, but uh, that one actually penetrates a, a major vessel uh, coming into the heart. Let me, let me show you then Exhibit 186. Is that the better view of it? Yes. You said something about it going into the vessel of the heart. Um, why don't you explain to us a little bit about what the heart is and whether or not when you said that it stabbed the vessel of the heart, whether it actually hit the heart, whether it hit the, the pericardium is what surrounds the heart, right? The sac around the heart. The sac, yes. whether it hit that, if you could just sort of explain that one to us. Well, I do want to clarify first on the photograph that it's the lower of the two wounds there, so not the one next to the scale, but the right, one so below it's this it one that we're talking is the about. one that goes into the vessel. Um, what this actually does is it goes through um, uh, the cartilage uh, between the ribs and the breastbone. There's some softer cartilage, especially in young people. And this knife has penetrated that cartilage and gone through the sac that surrounds the heart, which is the pericardial sac. And it has perforated or passed through the superior vena cava, which is a major vein that comes down from the upper body and the head and drains into the heart. And then from there, the heart beats and pushes the blood elsewhere in the body. But it's a, it's a major vessel. With regard to that major vessel, and I was talking about the, the, the tissue that encases the heart, is that vein inside that tissue that encases the heart, or is it outside on top of it? Where, 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 where it starts out it? outside and enters the sac and then enters the heart, which is fully within that sac. And this knife wound, did it penetrate the sac and hit this vein or not? Yes. So what happens when a stand, or when a knife goes in and, and causes this amount of damage or this type of damage? Well, depending on the position of the body, uh, you may have significant internal bleeding. Um, or if the person is leaning forward, they may bleed outside of the body because there is a track leading from that vessel outside. Um, but this is a major vessel. Uh, it's not going to bleed as fast as an artery, but it will bleed a considerable amount. With regard to this considerable, considerable amount of bleeding that's going on, is this a wound that could kill this person? Yes. And do you have an estimate or is there any science out there that tells you well, this type of wound, given what I know about it, would take X amount of time. No, it depends on so many factors. It depends on the person's health. It depends on care that they receive. It depends on their blood volume to begin with and the position of their body. Also, with regard to a situation like that, what if we have a person who's asleep, relaxed, versus an individual who's animated, jumping up and running around? Does that affect the amount of blood that is being lost and how quickly the blood is being lost? Yes, a person in action is going to have a rapidly beating heart and they will lose blood more quickly. And other than the blood coming out through here, we know that these others have bled also, correct? Yes. This one above and this one. Would any of these injuries, would, and for the example this one, would what we associate with television, would blood come out of the mouth, the ears, or, or just out of the chest area? It depends on what's hit inside the body. Um, if the lung was nicked, um, which is possible in this case because we're dealing with a decomposed body, so the, 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 the organs aren't as pristine, they're not as, uh, they don't lend themselves to examination as in a fresh um, individual. Um, but if the blood, if the lung is nicked, they can cough up blood. Um, if you uh, have blood going into the throat area, and he does have you know, throat injuries as well, which we'll talk about, um, all those can cause coughing up of blood or loss of blood out of the mouth and the nose. There is death and then there's also unconsciousness, correct? Those are two different things, right? Yes. With regard to this particular wound that's here at the bottom, is that something that would, once it's inflicted, would that cause Mr. Alexander <clears throat> to lapse into unconsciousness? Eventually, yes, not immediately. When you say eventually, uh, do you have an estimate, uh, maybe minute, seconds, uh, between the time of infliction and the time that he would lapse into unconsciousness? If that were the only wound, and it's not, um, probably a few minutes because we're dealing with a vein and not an artery. So it's a lower pressure system, so blood loss is slower. And how about if you take a look at that injury in connection with the things that we've seen with regard to his hands, the defensive wounds that we've talked about, does that tell you or at least in terms of time, does that indicate whether or not there was at least enough time for Mr. Alexander to attempt to defend himself and then get these other wounds to the hand? With this wound to the heart, he, he should have been able to get his hands up and <clears throat> attempt to defend himself. If he was in a seated position when this wound was inflicted, 
would he have the ability, even though this was inflicted, to get up and walk somewhere or move quickly somewhere, as a matter of fact? Yes. Exhibit number 187 shows us the injury to the right shoulder. Do you see that? Yes. Looks more like a scratch, doesn't it? It's very superficial, yes. Do any of these injuries, uh, including the one to exhibit 180, in exhibit 186, do any of these speak to movement or anything like that, or is just that's not something that these photographs show? Since they're on multiple parts of the body, they imply a motion of the assailant or a motion of the decedent, and I can't say which of those is the case. Exhibit 184, we do have the lower portion of uh, his body, correct? The lower part of the abdomen. Right. And we have this injury here, right? And then yes. we have these, right? Yes. If we go to exhibit 188, is that a close-up of them? Yes. Um, what are these down here to the, as we look at it, to the lower part of his belly button? There's a, another photograph which may not be entered into evidence, but there's a, a, a wound track that extends across the front of the belly from where this stab enters. So some of that, what you're seeing is blood actually appearing on the surface of the skin because of this, this track where the stab wound went is very close to the surface of the skin. So what I think you're saying with regard to this stab wound is that it went something like that. Yes. And so if we do that from the opening to the longest one, how, how far is that? I gave a maximum wound track depth of about five and three quarter inches. Uh, Dr. Horn is referring to his report. Can you have that marked, please? Do you want to mark yours or do you want to mark another one? It's the same report, so. I think we have one marked. We were talking about the length of this one, and this one is, I think, says five and three quarters. Yes. What is the angle of that? Uh, it's across the body from left to right and slightly downwards. So it's sort of uh, came sort of from the side right here. Yes. Correct? And was he alive at the time that this happened, or was he deceased at that time? More likely than not alive, since there is bleeding associated with the wound. And you're talking about this down here, the bruising that's down here, correct? Yes. Is this area in the belly button, is that also associated with the stab wound? Yes, it's going across the navel. And um, what, let's start with the right leg. What are we looking at there? Uh, apart from some decomposition changes, he also has uh, some, some contusions or bruises on the shin area. Right, right here? Is that correct? On the right shin, yes. Uh, let's take a look at uh, 191. Does that show it better? Yes. And the question is, is the same. Was, were these injuries here, were these inflicted here at the time of death, before death, after death, can you tell? I believe they're inflicted before death. Would these be consistent with this individual being dragged somewhere while he was alive? Or <clears throat> sustained. You're familiar. You've done how many autopsies, sir? About six thousand. And during that time, have you seen and studied uh, the situation where someone is? dragged before death. Have you seen that situation before? Yes. How many times would you say? At least three or four times. And looking at that along with your, and have you read up on this area? 
Is no, there any that? No. Given what you know and what you've seen in your work, and you said that these uh, injuries are before death, would, could that be consistent with someone being dragged? Uh, could those be consistent with somebody being dra dragging him along or him being dragged? Usually what you see in a dragging is you'll see more drawn out abrasions. These look more like impacts to me against something. Um, bruising is usually from stumbling against something or being forced against something. So in other words, these are consistent, more consistent in your view with him hitting something before death? Yes, or something hitting him. How about if we then go to exhibit 190? And which, he, this is the right heel or left heel? That is the left heel. And what do we have here in the back of the left heel? I call them abraded lacerations. So a laceration as opposed to an incised wound is actually a tearing of the skin rather than cutting. And it's abraded. So there's an abrasion or a scrape leading into the, to the laceration. Um, and that is also from a contact with an object of some kind. And again, were these made before or after um, his death? I believe before because they are hemorrhagic. And you said hemorrhagic, that means they were bleeding, You're right? Bleeding into them, yes. But these do imply some sort of action, correct? I mean, there was movement. A, a force, yes, a blunt force. To go back to this uh, exhibit, which is 191, and looking at the left foot, do you see this right here? That area there by the uh, heel? Yes. Uh, what is that? That is a contusion or a bruise. So that's also, the, how is that different than the abrasion that we've talked about? A contusion or a bruise is just bleeding under the skin. Um, the skin is intact, whereas an abrasion or a laceration, the skin is scraped or torn. And if we look at the, he, at the knee here, is that a contusion or an abrasion? I would characterize that as an abrasion. And in contrast, the other things we've been talking about, I'd say that, that looks more like a post-mortem change. It's, uh, it's got some drying, and it's kind of a yellowish in color. So it really doesn't look like, a, like an anti-mortem or an injury before death. So this could be something after death? Yes. Um, and if an individual, I know it begs the question, but if an individual is dead, they're not going to be moving around to cause this, right? No. Are, are you then telling me that actually a force was applied to this area as opposed to Mr. Alexander either moving or, or, or striking himself? That's more likely, yes. Look at uh, Exhibit 192. And the uh, injuries that jump out of us are these right here. Are you familiar with the term grouping? Yes. Is, is this a grouping of injuries? Yes. And what does that mean to you? Uh, well, more likely than not, they occurred close in time. And um, they, a lot of them, most of them, have the same orientation. When you say that they have the same orientation, what does that mean? And I'll show you exhibit number. Um, 193. What do we mean about the same orientation? In general, except for one exception that I can see at the lower edge, they're all oriented exactly the same direction. Um, and what direction is that? Uh, they're in a diagonal extending from the right shoulder towards the lower uh, left side of the back. So if these were inflicted like this? Yes. And with one exception, which exception is that? Uh, the lower there's a pair of, of wounds. It appears that there's one that's sort of going the other direction, the other diagonal. And these injuries that we're talking about that are coming this way like that, would they, could they be consistent with the individual having his back, as I have it to you, turned to his attacker and the attacker just stabbing him like that? Yes. How many um, are there here? Uh, starting with this one here, cutting across, to the other shoulder, sort of in a triangular fashion, if you will. How many um, stab, how many injuries do we have there? We have nine injuries, and they're all clustered together there in the center. Uh, what you're seeing on the upper left side is actually post-mortem artifact. There's some skin slippage there and some drying. Is that, is that what we're talking about there? Yes, or in this all one, right? of this area here where, where your pen is. And also right here, I, I believe, yes. correct. And you said that there were how many, nine? Nine. Um, are these stab wounds or are they incised wounds? Which is the they're term. stab wounds. So which means that they're deeper than they are longer, correct? Yes. Um, how deep is the deepest one there? 
they're all about the same depth. They're about an inch deep, and they're going into the back parts of the ribs and the spine, uh, the spinal bone, and stopping there. And none of them, to my exam, uh, none of them entered the chest cavity, although with de decomposition, you can't completely rule that out. When you say that they went up to the, to the bones, does it mean is that, that they stopped there, or did the knife blade continue past the bone? Do we, do we know that, or does decomposition affect that? They appear to all have been stopped by the bones. And that does speak a little bit to the pressure that's being applied to them, right? That they didn't go through the bone, right? It, it depends on the force of the assailant and also the type of weapon that's used. And if you know, um, maybe you do, maybe you don't, you know approximately how much force there was that, that was applied there or not? I couldn't say. It would depend on the thickness of his bones as well, so there are a lot of variables. But needless, they didn't go through the bone, right? Correct. And the left foot, we um, you see that right there? On, I'm going to move it up. The knee area, you see that? And is that the one that we talked about, that probably post-mortem, or is that a different uh, That was on the other side, but again, that has the same sort of appearance. It's not the best view, but it looks like a dried, almost like a parchment-like appearance, and that's something that we see with uh, after death. And the left foot has the abrasion, I think you called it. Yeah, there's a contusion on uh -huh. the ankle area, and then also that um, abraded area of laceration on the Achilles tendon. look at exhibit 193 again and we've talked about this grouping and we see the head and the neck let's take a closer look at that and exhibit 195 what 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 are we looking at there this is um after I've inspected the back of the head I've shaved some of the hair away to better show the injuries and what you have here are uh, deep incised wounds, so they're longer than they are deep, uh, but they are very deep. They're going all the way to the skull, and there's two of them on the back of the skull. It, it, given the way you described it, and it may have been something that I was reading into it, but it appears that you, the way you described it, that there was some force that was applied to these particular wounds to get to where they got. Well, if, if you have a very sharp blade, it actually wouldn't take very much force at all to cut the, cut the tissue very deeply. All it is is just uh, connective tissue that forms the scalp. Now, to go through the bone, that would, that would be a lot more force that would be needed. And this one right here, how long is that one? I have it as uh, two inches on the autopsy report. And what above it? <coughs> two inches as well. The fact that the hair is there, does that affect um, the strength needed to get into the, or get this sort of injury, or is that just something that the hair really is not something that you deal with or think about? His hair is very short. I mean, if he had longer, bushier hair, it might, it might uh, cushion the head somewhat or protect the head, but in this case, he's got short hair, so I don't think it played, played a role. Taking a look at uh, Exhibit 198, what are we looking at there? Uh, what you actually see here are the, uh, the edges, uh, and it's only in one portion of those incised ones we saw. Uh, there was some force applied that was sufficient to cause a divot in the skull bone. So this is actually after the skull, uh, the scalp has been reflected away from the skull. And what you're seeing here is actually a divot in the center of the skull. And then over on the left side, you see another one, and there's hemorrhage around those. So the, the bone was actually sort of chipped away by the end of the implement there. We take a look at Exhibit 199. What are we looking at there? This, to me, is the tip of, a, of an implement, probably the tip of a knife or something similar, because it has this very triangular profile. And this is the bone, and the piece of bone has actually been chipped away by the end of the, of the object. If we go back to Exhibit number 195, what this divot uh, in Exhibit 199, where was it, uh, as, it so, as, as it applies to these two? Right. There's one at the extreme left end of the longer wound at the bottom. Right here? And then one towards the middle of the top wound. Right here? Yes. So we're looking at there, and we're looking at there. When we look at exhibit number 198, you're looking at here and here. Yes. 
Exhibit 196, the focus on the area that's down here to the bottom. And also to the front, if you will, of the head. Take a look at Exhibit 197. In terms of these two injuries that we saw back there, where is this one now? This one's actually uh, towards the front of the head. So you're looking at the top of the head near the hairline on the forehead. At the very bottom, you'll see uh, Mr. Alexander's eyebrow, his left eyebrow. So this is a small incised wound uh, at the forehead near the hairline on and the... Any of these wounds that we've been talking about, the ones with the sharp instrument, are they any of those after death or are they all pre-death? I think they're all pre-death. They all have bleeding associated with them. What are we looking at there? The uh, right side of Mr. Alexander's neck behind the ear. And these were also were taken at the time of the, your examination? Yes. Who for the initial Of all of these injuries that we've taken a look at so far, how many of those have been the type that would have been fatal of all the ones that we've looked at so far? The head, the back, and then the one to the front. Taken together, all the wounds of the back and the head could have been fatal from bleeding over time. Um, the most significant wounds are going to be the neck wound, which we haven't talked about yet, the stab wound that penetrates the heart, the vein leading into the heart, and then also the gunshot wound, which we also haven't discussed. All right, let's take a look at uh, Exhibit 200. And um, what are we looking at here? This is another stab wound of the back part of the skull behind the ear. So there's bone underneath there. It goes down into that bony area and also goes into the muscle, uh, the strap muscle that is on the side of the head below the ear. And we're looking at 201. How big is that one? One and one quarter inch. Exhibit number 202. What are we looking at there? That is the back opposite side of the neck on the left side of the neck, and that's another stab wound. What do we see here? That's another stab wound to the back left side of the neck, and that also penetrates into uh, muscle on the back of the neck. And how long is that one? One inch. Take a look at uh, exhibits 203 through 206. And what do they portray? Uh, the largest wound of the neck um, across the throat. Sir, when we're looking at these kinds of wounds like the ones in the neck, are you able to um, tell, for example, uh, if it started on the left side or the right side? Do you know by looking at these um, where the wound may have started or not? I'm not able to say. Take a look at. Uh, 203. Okay, what are we looking at? I guess we'll do this. What are we looking at here? Uh, this is a side view of the neck wound, and, and it's probably one of the better views to show how deep it goes. And how deep is this wound? What, what is it that was cut as this uh, knife came through the... Okay, referring to my autopsy report. Sure. Uh, it passes through um, the airway, so the windpipe is cut through. Let me stop um, you there. When it passes through the airway, does this individual, as it's going through there, lose, lose the ability to scream at that point or not? It's uh, below the larynx, below the voice box, so yes. And if this person, well, this person is alive at this point, according to you, right? He was yes. still alive at the time yes. this was inflicted. Would the, where would the blood start coming out as, as a result of this wound here? Well, right next to the windpipe are the major vessels of the neck. So you've got the carotid artery, you've got the jugular vein, and on the 
right side, not the left, but on the right Let's side. Let's take a look at exhibit number 204. That's the right side, correct? Yes. Uh, you're not going to be able to see it in this picture to any great advantage, but uh, my examination did show uh, that the jugular vein and the carotid artery on the right side were both cut. And I, looking at this, how, how deep is this wound that we have here? Uh, it goes all the way back to the spine, so it's um, three inches, four inches. And um, if a person were to have the spine cut off, is that where the feeling stops and they don't feel anything? Or yeah, It doesn't go through the spinal cord, so it, it doesn't penetrate that bone. So it's actually the soft tissue and structures of the front of the neck and then stops at the bone. Exhibit 205, what are um, we looking at here? And this is a frontal view of the same wound. Uh, in looking at this, do you see how it's, my term, scalloped? Yes, um, there, there's some irregularity, and a lot of that is due to the, um, the drying of the wound that's happened after death. Uh, it, if you inspect the edges of the wound, it is actually a cleanly incised wound, and it's retracted a bit and gotten a bit larger after death because the tissue has dried and retracted away. Are you familiar with the term hesitation marks? That's yes. Are there, and what are hesitation marks? Uh, very occasionally, we'll get suicides like this. We'll get people that cut their own throat, and it's very unusual for them to just cut their throat. They will do shallow cuts, and they'll sort of do test cuts, and then they'll do a deep cut. Um, so we call those little smaller cuts hesitation marks, and we don't see anything like that here. Exhibit 206, um, what, are you, what are you doing here? I'm trying to show the profile of the wound a bit better, uh, put the wound together so we have sort of an idea of what the wound looked like before it separated. And see this right here? Is that, is that an indication of where it started or you can't tell where it started? I can't say whether it started on the right or the left, but it's across the neck. Once this was inflicted, what kind of wound is this? We talked about the one that's in the chest and you said, well, that's not immediately fatal uh, and the person would be conscious. Once this was inflicted on Mr. Alexander, um, is this something that's, number one, rapidly fatal, and number two, um, what about lapsing into unconsciousness? If you could have talked to us about those two aspects. Well, he has two major vessels in his throat that have been cut. Uh, he's going to lose a great deal of blood very quickly. He's going to lose consciousness within seconds, likely, and then die a few minutes later. So if an individual receives this wound, would it be, would he be able to get up and walk, let's say, 12 feet, 6 inches somewhere? Yes. He, he could, could do get that. up and walk a couple of feet. That's possible. He could move, yes. And then he would? Collapse. And in terms of in unconsciousness, so how much time are we talking about? A few seconds, probably. And death, how long would it take for this person to die if this was the only injury? If this was the only injury, again, uh, probably a few minutes. In this case, though, you've, you've seen that there were other injuries, and uh, you also alluded to the fact that there was a gunshot wound, right? Yes. Let's take a look at uh, exhibits 207 through 210. And what do those deal with? They show the, uh, the gunshot wound of Mr. Alexander's right forehead. And we also have the, uh, the bullet. Did you recover it? Yes. Move for the admission of exhibits numbers 207 to 210. Exhibit 207. Um, what is this right here? That's a gunshot entrance wound. And what's the trajectory of this gunshot wound? It uh, passes down through the skull, um, passes through the face and uh, downward and to the left, and terminates in the left cheek. In looking at this, are you able to tell or give us a determination as to the distance between the muzzle and his temple? I'm not. Uh, I, I called it an indeterminate range. Uh, I don't have sooting. I don't have stippling. 
I mean, the indicators of a range of fire here. So we really can't tell how far away it was. That's right. And 208 just shows us that same injury with the ruler next to it, right? Yes. Exhibit 209, what do we see there? That is the left cheek, and I've made an incision and removed the bullet here. This bullet and the trajectory that you've described, did it affect the brain at all? In other words, did it strike the brain or not? It must have. It passed through the, uh, the front right portion of the skull. Uh, the problem in this case is that the brain was decomposed, and the brain is, is a very soft structure to begin with, so it, it falls apart very rapidly after death. Uh, so I was not able to see a track through the brain, but just because the, the bullet passes through the front part of the skull where the brain normally would be, I have to conclude that the brain was perforated. And if the brain is perforated, what would happen to this individual once he was shot? He'd be incapacitated. Went down? Yes. Immediately? Rapidly, yes. Exhibit 210 is what? That's the bullet after recovery. Let me show you Exhibit 244. If you want, go ahead and open it. Mr. Alexander die. What was the mechanism of death? In other words, um, how did he die? Primarily blood loss. And tell me how that works on the body in terms of the blood loss and what that does to the individual as he dies. Well, after you lose blood, you lose the ability to provide oxygen to your major organs, including your brain and your heart. Um, in this case, uh, the first thing that would happen would be dizziness followed by loss of consciousness and then death. In this particular case, you've indicated that there are three uh, specific injuries that could have led to death. We talked about the stab wound in the chest. We've talked about the slitting of the throat. And then we've talked about the shot to the head. With regard to the uh, shot to the head, uh, would that have been rapidly fatal? Likely would have been. And by rapidly fatal, what are we talking about? Well, you, if you have a projectile going through the front part of the brain, uh, the person may not die immediately, but they'll probably lose the ability to function normally. They'll lose consciousness, and they'll be laying on the floor. Short, in short, very short order. In other yes. Words, shot, they go down. Yes. How about the slashing to the throat in terms of uh, whether or not it's rapidly fatal or not? I think by far it's the most significant injury. And, uh, would and have been why do you say that? Well, it's just the most uh, hemorrhagic injury. It's the one that I can demonstrate the most significant injury to the structures that are going to cause death, like the carotid artery, the windpipe, and the jugular vein. And then the one to the heart, is that, I think we've talked about it, but in terms of rapidly fatal, less, less fatal, um, which of these, if we're going to apply that standard as to which are the most fatal, how about the one to the chest? Is that the most fatal or the least fatal? Which probably, may not be there. Probably the middle. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a significant injury. It would, it would definitely cause death without medical attention. And would that cause unconsciousness in, immediately? Yes. Oh, not immediately. Not the chest wound, no. From what I'm hearing you say, of the three that we've talked about, two of them, the one to the neck and the one to the gunshot to the head, those appear, from what I hear you saying, that those would cause unconsciousness quickly. Immediate. Immediately. Yes. And the one to the chest would not. Less likely. So if that's the scenario, and in this case we have the um, defensive wounds to the hands, what does that tell you about the sequencing of these three injuries? I believe the wounds to the hands must have occurred before the fatal injuries, either of the head or of the throat. And so what you're saying is that at some point during the stabbing, uh, but before the slashing of the throat and before the gunshot to the head, this individual grabbed the knife. Or, or attempted or, to. Or the knife was applied. Objection leading. Rephrase. Tell me about the sequencing of events as it applies to the two injuries, and one to the head and the slitting of the throat, and when this individual may have grabbed the knife or the knife was applied to his hand. With the throat wound and the head wound, I don't think this person could have had a purposeful activity, meaning 
I don't think they could have raised their arms and attempted to defend themselves. With the chest wound, uh, that's possible because he would not have been immediately um, unconscious. In terms then between the other two, so that would mean then that it would appear that, in your opinion, the first wound would have been the one to the chest. Oh, chest for me. Rephrase. Which one, which one would have been first in your opinion? Well, the stab wound could have occurred and then the defensive injuries could have happened after the, after the wound to the chest occurred. Right, okay. And then in terms of the sequence of the injuries involving the three major ones that we talked about, what is your opinion? Well, the throat injuries and or the head wound are going to be immediately incapacitating and he's not going to attempt to defend himself after that. Okay, uh, in terms of the shot to the head, do you have any opinion as to whether or not he was alive at the time that that shot was struck? I can't say. Do you have an opinion as to the wound to the neck, whether or not he was alive at the time that that was uh, rendered, if you will? I believe he was. There's a great deal of hemorrhage associated with that. And was he alive with regard to the one to the chest that we've been talking about? Yes, I believe he was. Can you tell with regard to the gunshot wound to the right temple whether or not he was alive or not at that point? Uh, again, there's a wound going through the head, and I don't see hemorrhage in the brain. I can't see a wound track through the brain, so all I know is that there's a bullet going through the brain, so I can't say with certainty. And if we don't see hemorrhaging or bleeding, as you talked about, is that an indication that the person was already dead? They may have been, yes. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. Um. I want to talk to you a little bit about the gunshot wound, okay? Yes. All right. Now, we looked at the pictures, and from the pictures, it looks as though the gunshot wound, the gunshot goes in, there's an entry. Well, you're familiar with an entry wound, what that means, right? Yes. And an exit wound? Yes, there is no exit wound in this case. Okay, and an, eg and an exit wound is when a projectile is leaving the body? Yes. Okay, so there's an entry wound right above his uh, right brow, is that right? Yes. Um, and just in the middle of his brow, just uh, above it, actually. It's above it, yes. Okay. Uh, and you said there's no exit wound? No exit wound. So that means that during the autopsy, you recovered uh, the projectile in his left cheek, right? Yes. Or correct, I should say. Um, and it was in, uh, we know that the trajectory, uh, which is the pathway of the bullet, right? That's it, the it's the direction. The yes. direction. So we know that the direction of the bullet, based on the where it went in and where it lodged, we know that it was coming in from the left and going down. C coming in from the right and going down and ending up on the left side. I'm sorry, heading left. Heading left, yes. Okay, right, coming in from the right-hand side, heading in the direction of left, and then lodging in the left cheek. Yes. Okay. And it was coming in a downward position, right? It may have been deflected by the bone since it's passing through the skull. So its position in the cheek may not be the, the actual trajectory at the beginning of its path. Okay. So, um, and you know, I would assume from being a doctor, I've always heard that head wounds bleed. The scalp is something that bleeds a lot. Is that true? Yes, scalp wounds do bleed. Okay, so um, a head wound, a bullet entry wound on above in the, in the scalp, just above, or not the scalp, but just above in the forehead, is that something that's going to have a lot of blood associated with it typically? In, in a living person, yes. Okay, and so if this bullet wound is made in, while Mr. Alexander's living, there's going to be blood coming out of it, right? Yes. And it would be, of course, in the pictures we just see a small little hole, but when it actually happened, if Mr. Alexander was living, there would have been quite a bit of blood coming from there. Uh, generally, yes. Depends on what other wounds have happened. Okay. So if the throat's already been cut and he's already been bleeding from that wound, there might, there might be considerably less blood from that wound. Okay. Assuming, though, that Mr. Alexander was alive at the time that the gunshot wound is done, so that the heart is still pumping, that in that situation, you would agree, right, that there would be lots of blood coming from the gunshot wound? In that abstract sense, yes. Okay. And then the left cheek, the, the projectile lodging in the left cheek, that's something that would typically cause bleeding, wouldn't it? 
Uh, wherever it is along its path, it's going to cause bleeding along the path. So yes, there would be bleeding into the cheek, there'd be bleeding into the forehead and into the skull intervening. Okay, and in the cheek where you, where you were able to recover the projectile, that would be something that, had Mr. Alexander been alive, that blood would be going from his cheek and probably into his mouth, wouldn't it? I don't have any evidence that it passed through his mouth. So if it's actually going through, and when I say cheek, I mean, I do mean this bone up here, the maxilla, which is really not connected to the oral cavity except by the sinus. So I'm not saying that it went through his oral cavity. Okay, so you're talking about it being lodged in the cheekbone? Cheekbone or beyond the cheekbone, up, up here in the soft tissue above where the mouth is. Okay, and you said that's connected to the mouth, mouth through the sinus Right, there's a cavity? maxillary sinus, right. All yes. right, so if there was bleeding associated with that, then would we expect to see blood into the sinus or through the nose and then eventually into the mouth? It's likely, yes. All right, and you talked about the pathway um, well, well, let me ask you this. You talked a little bit on direct about um, not knowing the distance from the muzzle of the gun to Mr. Alexander. Yes. So, so when you're talking about that, you're really talking about things like stippling, right? Stippling or soot, soot. that deposits on the skin, right? Okay. Can you tell us what stippling is? Uh, stippling is um, sometimes out of the end of a firearm, if the person's close enough when they're being shot, you'll have little pieces of burning gunpowder that will come out of the end of the gun and will embed themselves in the skin. And so you'll get these little tiny dots, little stipple marks around the wound. And when we see that, we usually say that's an intermediate range of fire. And it depends on the type of firearm you're using, but it may be a couple of feet away or maybe up to a yard away, depending on what gun is used. Okay, so when, we, when you see stippling, you would, that tells you it's that the muzzle of the gun was probably within two to three feet away from the person? Depending on the gun. So some can be considerably further away, some can be closer than that and leave stippling. So what you'd have to do is actually get the gun and test fire it. Okay. Um, now when you talk about stippling and it leaving marks, those are actual burn marks, aren't they? There are abrasions, and they may be, there may be some burn to that, but most of the time it's just it's an abrasion, and it's a piece of gunpowder that's embedding itself in the skin. Okay, and those abrasions, um, they're not just going to go away if somebody were to, to pour water over them, right? No, they're embedded in the skin. So we know that Mr. Alexander's body was found in the shower and that it appeared that there was water at some point put over his body. That's yes. not going to get rid of any stippling, right? It may wash out some of the gunpowder fragments, but the, the marks, the stipple marks, would still be there generally. All right, and you're confident that you would be able to know that, right, from your experience? Well, with decomposition, it may be less apparent, but in looking at him and looking at his face, I didn't see any stipple marks. All right, and so based on the fact that there's no stippling marks, you can say, I, I know you talk about an indeterminate range of fire, right? Yes. And that means, t what does that mean to you? That means I couldn't determine a range of fire. Okay. Based on the autopsy alone. Okay. Um, but because there's no stippling, doesn't it also mean that we know that the gun certainly wasn't next to his forehead? I don't think it's a contact wound. A contact wound will usually leave a, a, like a star-shaped tear, and I don't see that here. Um, if it's not right up against the skin, if it's, but if it's very close, you usually see soot and not stippling. I don't see soot. I don't see a, a star-shaped tear, and I don't see stippling. So that, for me, takes it out beyond the range of an intermediate. So it's either a distant range or indeterminate. Uh, an indeterminate range of fire could be that, that there's some object in between the face and the gun. So if there's a, a garment, a towel, something like that, that can also cause you to be unable to determine a range of fire. All right. And um, so you know it. You know that, that we're talking at least two to three feet away, if not more, because of the no stippling. That's likely. Okay. okay, so what we were talking about is um, here you can see uh, what appears to be a head, right? Yes. All right, and this appears to be an arm. I think so, yes. Okay, and then this would be somebody's shoulder. Yes. And then the very distant part of the picture, you can see what appears to be a foot. Yes. So. In this picture, it would appear to be um, somebody uh, lying down almost on the floor, right? It appears that the person is lying down. I think if this is tile here, yes, that would be him laying on his back. Okay. Um, and you can see what would appear to be blood, right? Yes. Something that's dripping over his shoulder? Yes. 
And that would be um, that would be the person's right shoulder, wouldn't it? Yes. And also in this picture, the arm is up, isn't it? Uh, it looks like it's flexed up, yes. Okay, so in other words, it's not just laying limp on the floor, right? Right. Okay. And the head is also up, right? Yes, except that I don't know what this blue object is, if it's something that the head's resting against or what this is in the foreground. Does this appear to be like a foot and then a pant leg? Could be. Okay. Um, but from, from what you can tell from the shoulder, the shoulder doesn't, the shoulder is definitely off the ground, isn't it? I think so. Okay. And assume for a second if this is Mr. Alexander, once the wound to the neck occurs, having his head up and his arm up, certainly his head up, that would be near impossible, wouldn't it? Well, like I said, he's, he's going to have a few seconds of, of consciousness, and certainly enough, if he's laying on the ground to raise an arm or raise a head, that wouldn't be beyond the realm of, of possibility. But unlikely, isn't it? I wouldn't say that, no. Um, I wouldn't think he'd be getting up and walking around, but picking your head up or moving your arm is not impossible. Okay, and you can see the, the blood coming over the shoulder, right? Yes. And if there was a neck wound at this point, wouldn't you expect to see quite a bit more blood than that? I don't see what's underneath him. Um, that seems to be a lot of blood to me, but I have no way of quantifying or telling how much is here, okay. just based on this photo. Okay. And we know with the gunshot wound, um, obviously you discuss it in your, um, in your uh, examination report, right? Yes. And And you talk about the track of the bullet begins in the frontal skull, is that right? Yes. And when you refer to the frontal skull, you're referring to a bone? Yes, the frontal bone of the okay. skull. Um, and we know that it ends in the facial skeleton near the left cheek. Yes. And again, as you, you told me earlier, the facial skeleton, you're referring to a bone. Right, the maxillary bone. All right. Um, now, in your, in your report, And let me just ask you, you did this report, actually you did the autopsy on June 12th of 2008, is that right? Yes. Okay. So on June 12th of 2008, after doing your report, you found that there was no evidence, no, without, no gross evidence of significant intracranial hemorrhage, is that right? And I'm looking yes. on page four. Uh, yes, page four of my report. Okay, and when you talk about significant intracranial hemorrhage, you're talking about bleeding through the brain, is that right? Right, and at this, at this point, the brain is really non-existent. It's almost, uh, it, it, you can't examine it. It's become liquid. You can't examine it at all? It's very difficult. Okay, well, but, but didn't you actually take slices of the brain? And I'm referring to page seven. Yes, so it is softened, it's not liquefied. So okay. it, is, it is still present, but it's soft. All right, so, so you were able, it, it, it's still there, right? Yes, it's always there, it's just the state that it's in. Okay, so the state that it was in, though, is that you were able to actually take what it, what's called autolyzed brain, um, multiple serial sections of autolyzed brain. Right, so the autolysis or autolyzed, that's a term that refers to the liquefied, liquefied brain tissue or very softened brain tissue. Okay, um, and when you talk about multiple serial sections, does that mean that you're taking slices of the brain to look through it? As best I can, I'm, I'm running a knife through the brain and trying to examine it. But okay. that may, may be actual sections or may just be in, in terms of trying to inspect the internal parts of that tissue, whatever's there. Okay. And, but according to your report, that's what you did, right? Right. And in there, so, um, so in this part of your report, after going through these sections, um, again, you say it does not reveal the presence of grossly apparent trauma. Is that right? Right. So by taking through these sections, again, you don't find any evidence of trauma or like a bullet track through the brain. 
nothing so clearly defined. No, no hemorrhage, no foreign bodies, no metal fragments. Right. Okay. And we know that people who have had injuries to their brains, um, depending on the section of the brain, they're not always incapacitated. Isn't that true? Uh, for the most part, if you have a bullet pass through the brain, um, you're not going to be standing, you're not going to be functional, um, you're going to fall. And, and like I said earlier in direct, uh, it may, may not be immediately fatal. In fact, it likely wasn't passing through the frontal part of the brain, especially. It's not a, as vital. I mean, they're all vital structures, but it's not as vital as the brain stem or the back parts of the brain. Well, just so we're clear, you don't actually have any medical evidence of it passing through the brain, right? It had to have passed through the brain. You don't have any medical evidence of that, do you? I do. Uh, the skull is perforated where the brain is, so it had to have passed through the brain. The brain well, is there. But you have no idea, you have no medical evidence of how far or what part of the brain it exactly would have hit, right? It would have passed through the right frontal lobe. Uh -huh. um, I just don't have any evidence of hemorrhage now because of decomposition. But it had to have passed through the brain because of the part of the skull that was injured. The brain, in a young person especially, is flush against that, uh, against that structure. The, mm -hmm. the brain occupies the entire skull. So to have a hole in the skull here and an exit in here, it has to pass through the brain. Well, the exit's here. There, there's no exit. What do you Exit think? from the skull cavity into the face. Uh-huh. So, but, but what you're saying, though, is you have no idea how, where that bullet might have hit. It could have just grazed the tip of the brain, right? No, it had to have passed through the right frontal lobe of the brain based and on where these holes in the skull are. And There's no way it could have avoided the brain. Okay, and you're sure of that? Yes. Um, what, what I was talking about earlier was that with brain injuries, I mean, we've all heard the stories of people, the person who had the arrow stuck through, went through his skull and hit his brain, or the person who had um, a, I don't know if it was an arrow or what, but actually goes through the brain and these people are coming to the ER. Right. You've heard those stories, right? Those are different. Okay. But those are people who've had brain injuries, right? Not with projectiles. Okay. Uh, with, with firearms, you don't just have an arrow or an object passing through the head. With a firearm, you also have gas and you have an expansile cavity that damages the brain as it goes through. So you can shoot an arrow through the brain. It's a much lower velocity projectile and will not cause a large temporary cavity to open up in the brain tissue like a projectile would, like a firearm projectile would. So those don't cause as much damage as a bullet does, is That's what you're right. saying? That's right. But you didn't see any damage, even I in could, your slices, right? Right. I could not document the damage because of the decomposition. <laughs> Isn't it true that at some point you told Detective Flores that you believed the first wound was the shot to the head? I don't recall ever saying that. So you think you never told Detective Flores that? I don't think that's consistent with the evidence that I have, and I don't remember ever saying anything like that. Okay, so what your testimony is, I just want to be clear, is that you never told Detective Flores that the gunshot wound was the first wound. I don't believe I ever said that. And do you remember telling Detective Flores that you knew this because the gunshot wound wouldn't have completely incapacitated somebody? I don't recall saying that either. Is that something that you think you would have never said to Detective Flores? I think I've said it here in court that I don't think it would immediately incapacitate him or kill him, but it would be, it would be a serious injury. But I don't recall t telling Dr. Uh, Detective Flores that, no. Okay. So... Let me back up for a second. So you're saying that the gunshot wound is not immediately incapacitating? I would say not immediately fatal. Okay, but I'm I not think, talking about fatal. I'm just talking about incapacitating. I think, yes, I think that the, it would be incapacitating. It's passing through his brain, so yes. Okay, so, and that's assuming it passed through his brain. You, you would say it's incapacitating, right? I'm saying it did pass through his brain. All right, um, and so, um, so then you wouldn't have told Detective Flores that 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 particular gunshot wound would not have completely incapacitated someone, right? I guess you wouldn't have said that. 
I don't recall saying, I don't recall having a conversation with the detective at all about anything. I'm sorry, I missed the last I, I don't recall having a, a conversation with the detective at all about this case. Okay. So do you remember then telling Detective Flores that Mr. Alexander could have been unconscious, but then you suspect that he became conscious again? No, I don't recall saying that. Okay, and you suspect that he became conscious or that you knew he was conscious because there's defensive wounds? Well, I think you'd have to be conscious during the defensive wounds. I don't recall telling Detective Flores that. Okay. But if the gunshot wound comes first, um, and then the defensive wounds come after that, obviously he would have to be conscious for that. I don't think that makes sense. I don't think he got the gunshot wound and then got defensive wounds. I think he would have been unconscious. Okay, so that's something you never told Detective Flores? Again, I don't recall ever having a conversation with him about anything. So if you don't recall ever having a conversation with Detective Flores, and we know that Detective Flores was at the autopsy, right? Right. So then, can we assume then that you never spoke to him again? That was 10 years ago, I don't remember. It, it, it wasn't 10 years Four, ago, it was in 2008. Two, six. <laughs> Four and a half. Several years ago. Okay, okay, so you don't, I don't remember. I don't recall speaking to him again, no. So then it's possible that you spoke to Detective Flores? Sure. Okay. Um, and it's then possible that you might have said these things to Detective Flores? I don't believe I would say those things, no. I don't think they're consistent with what I'm saying here. Okay. Do you remember giving the opinion to detect, your opinion to Detective Flores that the cut to the throat was the last <clears throat> wound? No. And so if Detective Flores would have testified in some other hearing that that's what you told him, He's wrong? Objection, Madam Chief Speculation. Sustained. And you remember, I take it you have no memory of discussing the scene photographs with Detective Flores? I don't, no. And in discussing the scene photographs with Detective Flores, telling Detective Flores that the gunshot wound would not have completely incapacitated Mr. Alexander? Again, I've been answering this question. I do not have any recollection of that, no. Okay, all right, thank you. In terms of the sequencing of the wounds, do you remember having an interview with this individual sitting here with the glasses? Do you remember having an interview with him? Vaguely. I do remember the defense interview. You were interviewed with regard to this case, right? Yes. And you have a copy of that interview, don't you? I do. And you were asked about the sequencing of these injuries, weren't you? Yes. Objection reading. Sustained. All right. Did you talk to them about the sequencing of the injuries? Yes. And at any time, did you stop the interview and say, no, I don't want to talk to you about the sequencing of the injuries? No. And were you asked about the sequencing of the injuries? Yes. And what did you tell them during that interview that you had with them? Uh, that I felt that the, uh, the gunshot wound may have been last, but at any event, um, the, the gunshot wounds and the wounds to the neck would have had to have come after the defensive wounds of the hands. And is that what you told us today? Yes. Now, sir, with regard to the procedure or the process that takes place when a body is brought in, in terms of when you conduct the examination, who is in the room with you? Uh, forensic technicians, pho uh, photographers, sometimes medical students. Do you take the photographs? No. Uh, in terms of the individuals from law enforcement, you indicated that they're there via your report, right? Yes, they're in an observation right. area. But in terms of the examination room itself, is the detective there looking over your shoulder and questioning you as you conduct this examination? Is that how it's done out there? No. Where are they, physically speaking, the detective, when this examination is going on? 
that they're in an observation bay separated by glass. And if they want to talk to you during this particular process, how does that work? In other words, if they want to provide you advice as to whether or not an injury went through the brain or not, how is it that they provide this advice to you? They don't, generally. And, but if they do want to talk to you, how does it happen? Uh, they have a handset they can pick up and I can hear them in the, in the autopsy area. And then I will come to the door or the window and I'll talk to them. And as you're conducting this examination, is it your practice to immediately form an opinion as to which injury is first, which is second, and which is third, if there's three of them? No. Why not? Why would you not immediately tell them, oh, I know this one's the first one, this one's the second one, this is the third one. Why wouldn't you do it that way? Well, often we can never establish that, but I do want to have an opportunity to look at the whole case, get investigative reports back, get toxicology, histology, and then come to a final report. And this report that you prepare, when is it due? In other words, how long does it take you to prepare this report with your impressions? Varies, uh, minimum of a month, maximum of four to five months, depending. In this case, I think you conducted the autopsy, what, uh, June 16th, I think? Uh, June 12th. June 12th. And what, is your re what date is your report dated? Uh, J uh, July 15th. And how many, so that's roughly what, a, a month uh, later? Five weeks, so, yeah. And how many pages is your report? Uh, eight pages. And in that report, is there any place that indicates that the gunshot wound or which, uh, which injury was first or last? Anywhere does it indicate that? No. In terms of you being asked about the sequence of events, in terms of these fatal injuries, when, according to your records, was the first time that you were asked about the sequencing of events? According to my recollection, it would have been at the defense interview. And before that, you didn't write it in your report, right? That's right. And is it your practice to write the sequencing of events in your report? No. Why not? It would be speculative. And uh, I, I am simply providing information about the injuries that I see. And then once you've had a chance to have all this information before you, that's when you make your determination then, right? Yes. The issue of the gunshot wound. Did the gunshot wound go to the front, go through the frontal lobe or not? It did. If it goes through the frontal lobe, what does the human body do when a gunshot goes through the frontal lobe? Well, there's a shock delivered to the entire brain as a projectile is passing through. So it's not just like an arrow or a nail. You've also got expansing, expanding gases. You've got a tumbling projectile. So generally, you're going to have, it's a shock situation, neurologic shock, and those people are incapacitated. And that gunshot wound that we're talking about, did it go through the mouth or not? It goes above the mouth. It's in the, in the sinus structures. So bleeding out of the mouth is certainly possible. And it ended up in the left cheek, correct? Cheek, yes. The distance of the, the, distance of the gunshot wound, you said it was indeterminate, right? Yes. And that's based on the fact that you don't see any stippling there, right? That's right. And indeterminate to you in this case, what's the, if it's indeterminate, I know, under, I know what the word means, but how far, can you give us any parameters whatsoever as to how far or, or how close the uh, gunshot was? Uh, again, I'm not a ballistics expert, um, but generally speaking, for most firearms, it's going to be a minimum distance of a couple of feet, at least. Okay. And... This gunshot wound, was there hemorrhage, hemorrhaging that was associated with it on the path that it traveled? Uh, in the scalp and in the cheek area, there is some hemorrhage. There is no hemorrhage for the, detected in the skull itself. And what does that mean to you in terms of the sequencing, whether or not the person was alive or not alive, if there's no blood there? If there's less blood, it may mean that the other injuries preceded that and there was just less bleeding because there was less blood to come out of the body. Could this person have been dead at the time that the gunshot wound was inflicted? That's possible, yes. 